Hi everybody, my name is Dominika Osvaldová and I'm Corporate Sustainability Specialist at SmartHead. Let me introduce today's speaker, Mrs. Rosabeth Muscanter, who is Professor at Harvard Business School and Founding Chair and Director at Harvard University Advanced Leadership Initiative. Professor Kanter has been listed among top 50 most influential business thinkers in the world and top 50 most powerful women in the world. Today's discussion will be led by Veronika Osvaldova, CEO at SmartHead, a company committed to advocating sustainability in the business world. SmartHead aims to create a global online platform of company sustainable actions where all stakeholders can take part, suggest, review, and take action. Today's discussion will be about the topic of corporate sustainability, advanced leadership, and change management. Veronica, Professor Kanter, the floor is yours. Dominica, thank you so much for this short introduction. Dear Professor Kanter, it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss with you. I believe that this uh, interview will inspire many companies to act more sustainably. So let me start with the first question. During corona, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, we have observed that many companies are involved and help governments in many ways. That also confirms the fact that companies play a crucial role in our society. Uh, one of the current biggest challenge, uh, challenges we face today is definitely climate change. And we know that in order to succeed, we need to involve also businesses. They need to transform their business from the traditional one to a more sustainable one. That's why my question is, what would be your recommendations for every single company that wants to make organizational changes from the old school way of doing business, which is only profit oriented, to a modern advanced one, which is also which also consider impact on the society and the environment. Well, first of all, let me say thank you um, for having me talk with you. I was very glad to do this because I really like to support women's enterprises and new groups that are attempting to do something to make a difference in the world. Very important. Now, I also have a new book out. It's called mm -hmm. Think Outside the Building. You can probably see that the letters go around um, because we're very much outside the building on the book jacket too. It's very That's important. an important idea, Think Outside the Building, because the pandemic and other crises show us that the threat to companies and the impact of companies cannot be confined to existing structures. So a few words of background before I answer your question directly. Mm -hmm. So in this book on the first page of the second chapter, uh, no, sorry, it's the first page of the first chapter. There were just a few things that came before it. Um, I mention a list of crises or problems facing the world that business has to get involved mm -hmm. in helping solve or else suffer the consequences. And um, included on that list, and remember that a book, um, this is new, but it had to go to print because it's a print book, not digital. Um, it had to go to print over a year ago. So this was my list. I said, global pandemics, that could fly to us on an airplane. I talked about racial justice and disparities, including in healthcare and education. Mm -hmm. And I talked about climate change, a continuing perplexing and important problem. And so many people said, oh, I had a crystal ball and I could see the future. Well, I didn't have to look too hard to be able to see that in our future because these issues have been building in importance for decades and particularly in the last decade mm -hmm. where for climate change in particular, the effects 
have been seen everywhere in extreme weather. And by the way, more people die in heat waves than in cold weather. Mm -hmm. Forest fires literally burning. And now we're also in the United States and it's spreading around the world, seeing the impact of injustices by race and other parts of the world are also starting to recognize those issues. Yeah. And of course, the pandemic, mm -hmm. which was predictable. It's been years when I go to business meetings, it's been years since I will shake hands. Mm -hmm. It can sometimes seem a little impolite, but I make sure that I'm holding something so that I don't have to because we've known, mm -hmm. particularly at international meetings, that people can be bringing viruses with them. Now, that's a kind of negative picture. And I'm a very positive, can-do, optimistic person. Mm -hmm. And I believe that these problems are something that businesses have a particular role in solving in their own self-interest. And we're seeing change there too. So when I say think outside the building, that means go beyond existing structures. Think beyond your organization charts. Think beyond your industry. Think mm -hmm. about your community. Think about your customers and what they're facing. Think about your suppliers. Supply chains are a very big issue in this pandem pandemic and see where you can take action. We know that business action is being helpful in the pandemic, switching manufacturing to make certain needed supplies gloves and masks and medical equipment, very important. But also businesses should be concerned about the welfare of their people. In the Ebola crisis that hit West Africa, in fact, it's hit several times, um, I talk in Think Outside the Building about a group that was bringing affordable alternative energy to Liberia. So mm -hmm. a very green climate change oriented product, green, clean energy at affordable prices that would also solve other problems. Children in rural areas where there was no electricity, the national power source didn't reach them. If they had solar cells, they could read at night and they could do well in school. Parents could charge the cell phone without having to walk sometimes as much as several hours a day to a place where there was a generator. So this was a positive business solution to many problems facing the country. And by the way, it was Americans, American business leaders that brought that project and that solution to mm -hmm. Liberia. That comes to your question about what I would advise a company just starting out. Well, think about what that company did in the Ebola crisis, what they had. First of all, they had a corporate culture that said we really value people. So every company should first look at their own values. Mm -hmm. And do they have them? Do they have values? Mm -hmm. Do they care about their employees? Do they put people first? Do they want to serve their customers to very high standards? Do they support action in all the communities in which they operate to make sure that it's a safe and healthy environment in that community. So look to your values. And if you don't have a statement of values, well, a statement on your web page doesn't mean very much, but it is a starting point. So you start with gathering your people and particularly top executives and say, what do we really care about? I know many companies that where the CEO has written the values mm -hmm. and then shown them to everybody to comment on. I think the best process is one where people can comment. They don't necessarily have to invent them for, from scratch, but it's important to stand for something. Yeah. And then once you know what you stand for, you can begin to scrutinize all of your practices to say, are you living up to those values? And environmental standards are certainly one of the things you want to look at. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do with the waste from your manufacturing pro pro process, sorry. Yeah. What do you do with the waste? Where does it go? Mm -hmm. Does it go into landfills? 
Or is there a way to recycle it and reuse it? In fact, some companies have businesses now using things that would otherwise be destroyed. There is Adidas, the running shoe manufacturer, has made a running shoe out of marine plastics, the plastic waste that has been washing up on Pacific islands. They have made shoes out of that waste. So you can look at your products. Where can you do things differently? You look at your suppliers. Do they have high standards? If you are buying things, say, from certain Southeast Asian countries, do they have child labor or do they meet high standards? Yeah. Um, do you want a fire in your factory in India? Or do you want, or Bangladesh, I guess, was the fire. Or do you want people to have safe working environments? So you look at your suppliers and your supply chain. At one point, the large retailer in the United States, Walmart, Mm -hmm. which has become a leader in being green, Mm -hmm. was informing consumers of whether the suppliers for particular products met the standards that Mm -hmm. Walmart had for them. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's your customers. What do your customers do with the product? Is it healthy for them? So you begin to look at all of that. And then I think the next thing you do is you involve your people in figuring out how to fix it. Because the intelligence often resides inside the company. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. And thank you so much for many, many examples and great examples, which can be repeated, you know, and this can bring exponential change. So this is very important to share best practices, what is really in our world, because yes, some is maybe ideas, but some we can see in the um, practic practically. So thank you so much. Uh, Professor Cantor, you made the research on Fortune 50 companies uh, to find out what are the key factors that help leading companies survive in the current changing environment. Uh, So the the key things to surviving in this particularly difficult time. um, Well, I do say think outside the building. That is, think beyond your existing structures. Think about new partnerships whether they are inside your industry or outside of the industry, because you can bet that things will not look exactly the same as they did before the pandemic. Things mm-hmm. will be much more digital. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we know that. We don't know exactly what will happen, but many people have said, It's often attributed to Steve Jobs, but actually people said it well before Steve Jobs, that the best way to predict the future is to create it. So you need to yeah, look far beyond what exists today, challenge assumptions, find new partners. Mm -hmm. You might explore industries other than your own that have ideas or analogies or new ways to partner, to combine to Mm -hmm. sell things together, to create something new in the combination. So one key success factor is, first of all, that leading companies that will be sustainable have a much broader view of things. The new CEO, not that new anymore, but the new CEO of a large telecom company in the United States, Verizon, who had been the CEO of Ericsson, Mm -hmm. So great European ties. He's Swedish, Hans Vestberg. Mm -hmm. He tells his people to do one new thing every week that they haven't done before or go to one new place. Mm -hmm. He wants them to have open minds Mm -hmm. beyond the routine of what they always do because they're in a fast-moving industry that's going to need change. So creativity, innovation, looking broadly, and then partnerships. Mm -hmm. The companies that will be sustainable don't try to go it alone. And they have a very collaborative attitude toward partners. They are certainly willing to protect their own assets. I'm not saying you give everything away to partners, but they are willing to form new partnerships to get things done and be very creative about the industries that they're in. Google 
is now in a large number of industries. I don't think that'll last. They can't all work, but mm-hmm. it's part of that creative exploration about the future. Mm-hmm. I like this, uh, your, um, your attitude about you should have good partners because it's necessary. We can create something big uh, alone. It's impossible. It's impossible. I, I still think and I believe that uh, the best company create best people and it's about teamwork. And uh, uh, actually, I wanted to ask you about what, what do you think about uh, to involve other stakeholders to the discussion to bring new ideas such as uh, customers, business partners, so wider audiences. Can benefit companies from cooperation with other stakeholders? Also, it's important, of course, uh, involve employees, but I think outside of the building, something like you have the title of your book. You are so right. I mean, other stake, all the stakeholders matter. I mean, employees are the the stakeholders closest to home, customers are stakeholders, suppliers are stakeholders, community partners, and others. And yes, in fact, for many companies, big companies that I've worked for, I've often said when they're having a big corporate meeting, where are the customers? Shouldn't you be having customers come and talk to you? Mm-hmm. about what they want, what they value, what they care about. And so I have been with many big companies that have had customers come into the meetings. One very big French company, mm-hmm. Global com- Global Marketing and Communications Publicis Group had its global top executive meeting in San Francisco and had many of the companies they work with in Silicon Valley with them, meeting them, talking to them, listening to them, influencing them, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. Single individuals have to do the same thing. In Think Outside the Building, I have many stories of individuals, not just the CEO, but -hmm. individuals who are beginning to create transformational change because Mm -hmm. they know how to create coalitions Mm -hmm. of many stakeholders. I'll tell you one little story because it's also a European. His name is Torsten Tila. He um, has lived in London. He's German. He had worked for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. He had worked for a major commercial bank in the UK, and he's passionate about climate change. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's one person. So this is an it. This is a big issue to him. Mm-hmm. And I say this to tell all of us that whether we have a big company or not, there are things we can do. So Torsten cared particularly about the oceans, and it turns out that the oceans are incredibly important in climate change. I mean, they cover most of the Earth's surface, and he, you know, there's a famous saying in English, you can't boil the ocean, Mm -hmm. meaning don't take on a problem that's so big, there's no way you could possibly do anything about it. Well, Torsten wanted to boil the ocean or actually stop it from boiling because it's heating up and the melting of the Arctic ice cap has consequences for businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, So he went to every meeting he could find, every international meeting. He talked to many NGOs. He talked to the government people. And he realized that one thing missing at the table was business. Mm -hmm. And it was a financial perspective. And so his big, bold idea was we need a World Bank for oceans. Mm -hmm. There's no World Bank for oceans to Mm -hmm. invest in projects around the oceans. And we need business at the table and a financial perspective about what to invest in that could make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so he began introducing groups that never talk to each other, NGOs like the World Wildlife fund or the nature conservancy he introduced them to banks he introduced banks to governments Mm -hmm. he was a great connector and convener and he's on his way he has worked with the economist newspaper he is at just about every it seems global meeting the paris climate agreement i'm sorry about what the u.s did after but we have an election maybe there will be change Mm -hmm. um But 
Torsten was the ultimate coalition builder. And as an individual, he did create an entity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is hard to go and knock on the door just as an individual. If you have a company, you're in a much better position. You have business cards. You yeah. seem to represent something. So, but the point is that you can take on some of the most daunting problems, find something new and different that can be done, and that's often in the interest of your business. He has worked with a coalition of insurance companies based in Bermuda, which has a lot of insurance companies because of tax laws, insurance, shipping, all those industries care about the state of the oceans. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he knows the people at Adidas who are doing the shoe, running shoe from marine plastics. Mm -hmm. So there is so much one can do as a company, as individuals, if you have the mindset about partnerships, as you said, you can't do it alone. And in fact, sometimes what you can do is convening mm -hmm. lots of stakeholders and finding a new initiative, a new project. We have some potential to change, to create a big change, but we need to inspire others, you know? It's, uh, it's about leader, individual who can who can spread uh, the inspiration and this is why we are talking together because it's necessary to put together the people who can spread the the way how we should do business how we should live our lives more respectfully uh, towards our society towards our environment and how we lead the business so I think that you maybe agree about that companies stakeholders can create a positive um, pressure that uh, at the end of the day can influence the direction of company's development? Well, it might take, you know, some, t some people say about change that it requires a burning platform, yeah. you know, to get a sense of, in of urgency. Well, we have a burning platform now. Mm -hmm. We have a pandemic. We have many climate crises. We have the racial inequities issue. And so, Business has a tremendous stake in seeing these problems be solved. And business confidence can make a big difference. New services, new products, and certainly new coalitions. Who can convene better than, for example, IBM, mm. a global company? Yeah. That if IBM calls and invites you to a conference, you come. Um, and so convening power is a kind of power that every business leader has and can use. You don't have to have all the answers, but starting the conversation is a very important thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, using the term of uh, Tom Peters, in search of excellence, uh, what is your definition of uh, an excellent company? Are there any companies in today's world that you could name by this term? Well, so first of all, um, I know Tom very well, and Tom's book, In Search of Excellence, came out a little bit ahead, um, not much, of my book, The Change Masters. And so we were often the two people who were looked to back then to have answers to how and why companies should change. Mm -hmm. There are some excellent companies that were excellent back then and are still excellent today. One is Procter & Gamble. Mm -hmm. I would also add Unilever. Mm -hmm. Those And in fact, Paul Pullman, who was CEO of Unilever for a long time, had come from Procter & Gamble. Mm -hmm. Those are companies with a very strong set of values. In fact, in Procter & Gamble, they talk about their purpose, values, and principles. PVP, purpose, values, and principles. And they create new products mm -hmm. based on whether they are serving customers. Their value statement says that they want to be improving the lives of the world's consumers now and for generations to come. That's the sustainability part. And I'm very pleased that actually on the back jacket of my book, Think Outside the Building, mm -hmm. there is a quote from the former chairman and CEO of Procter & Gamble, 
Robert McDonald, Bob McDonald, because he believed so much in mission-driven companies, and I was honored. He believes that we should all be finding our purpose. So the companies with that sense of purpose are among the excellent companies, and they are global in scope. They manufacture in many parts of the world. They sell products in many parts of the world, and yet they do it differently depending on where they are, and they care about sustainability. One, if, if we have time, one little Procter & Gamble story. Um, Procter & Gamble had bought a company that made a water purification tablet mm -hmm. um, because so many places in the world do not have clean drinking water mm -hmm. and it's a huge health problem. And it was the kind of product they know how to sell. Small consumers could buy it regularly at an affordable price not a big purchase and they were having trouble selling it mm -hmm. and among other issues it was that people had to see the relationship between this product which worked fabulously by the way mm -hmm. you could put it in a muddy river, river bottom and have clean water in 20 minutes but people didn't see the relationship between that and health they saved it for a special occasion Mm -hmm. They did better when the children were educated in school about this product, yeah. um, about clean water and health. So Procter & Gamble had a dilemma. As a values-driven company who believed in getting clean drinking water mm -hmm. to developed parts of the world, what to do about it? Because they're also a commercial company. Mm -hmm. And they have to put their investment where they're likely to make some money. Mm -hmm. So they wrestled with that dilemma, and then they set up a separate not-for-profit subsidiary mm -hmm. um, for the clean drinking water, partnered with the United Nations, partnered with health agencies, so that Procter & Gamble could make the product, give it to that entity at cost, and it could be available all over the world. So that's acting with your values on Amazing. something that's important, even if you can't make money immediately. But on a lot of things, you can make money. I'll bet they're selling a lot of soap right now. Yeah, this is this is great. This is a great example that if you want, because it's uh, according to your values, company's values, you will find always the way, you know, because uh, when you feel that this is the right direction, what you want to support, you will find the right partners also to create it. Yes. Uh, uh, dear Professor Cantor, uh, you are also the founding chair and director of the Harvard University Advanced Leadership Initiative that is uh, designed to unleash the potential of experienced leaders to help solve society's most pressing challenges. Uh, over the years, you have advised and cooperated with many CEOs, uh, uh, well-known brands, what are the main characteristics of advanced leaders according to your experience? Well, I mean by advanced leaders, people who take on problems outside of the hierarchy. It's not just within your company. It's not just your team. It's these bigger issues of change that affect your company. They may be part of your business, but they are bigger and more difficult problems. That's why I call it advanced. And many CEOs have to be advanced leaders. They have to look broadly in the context. That's why I call it thinking outside the building. Mm -hmm. And their characteristics are, first of all, they care about impact. They measure the work they're doing, not just on immediate returns, although that's very important, but they also want to measure it by ultimate impact, what are the results for all stakeholders? Yeah. And they care about making a difference in the world, so they have values, because in part it's their legacy. Mm -hmm. It's how they're going to be known as individuals. And then it's their children and grandchildren, the world they're going to live in. So they never forget the human side. Mm -hmm. I talked earlier about curiosity. They're curious. They always want to learn. They make great relationships. Mm -hmm. um, 
the former chairman, uh, he's still executive, cha- non-executive chairman, um, uh, CEO of Publicis Group, Maurice Levy in Paris, is a master at relationships, at listening to other people, at empathy, mm-hmm. at understanding their needs, which makes it a lot easier to make them your partner or to integrate an acquisition. So I think it's those characteristics, that wide-ranging curiosity, a set of values, great relationships, and a desire to make a difference. Yeah, yeah, this is very important. And maybe I would like to ask for the, uh, some example of advanced leadership in current world, and uh, like the example, and also what uh, they are working on. The kinds of things the people that I have been working with are working on. Well, I, um, so this was, has been a 15 year journey, but um, at the end of 2018, we now have a new faculty chair and director because every organization to be sustainable needs succession. Mm. So even if it's a family business, don't remain CEO forever because it's not sustainable if it depends on one person or a small group of people. But I stay in touch with the Advanced Leadership Fellows, many of whom were or still are CEOs. One of them is CEO of Sesame Street, Sesame Workshop. All those cute Muppets who are bringing early childhood education all over the world. And one of the things they're also working on is a partnership with the International Rescue Committee to bring early childhood education to refugees in camps in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I have another set of fellows who are also working on the refugee crisis, Syrian refugee crisis, which I know has affected Eastern Europe a great deal. And they have brought a business mindset They realize that there are many skilled and talented refugees that are in camps in Jordan and Lebanon. And so they created a matching platform Mm -hmm. that would identify the skills of refugees and also the needs of employers, companies that need people with just Mm -hmm. those skills. They started with Canada and Australia. Mm -hmm. They had a little bit of money from the U.S., but now is not the time to talk to the U.S. about refugees and immigration, unfortunately. Um, and they have started matching the needs of employers, uh, a butcher shop in Australia that needs a really skilled meat cutter, mm-hmm. a manufacturer in a part of Canada that's having trouble getting young people to move to that area. Um, has identified an experienced tool and die cutter to go into that firm. So that's a second project. Another project has started a new retail concept Mm -hmm. that is bringing nutritious, affordable food to people who don't have enough nutrition and doing it while saving the environment. Because Mm -hmm. it turns out that wasted food is one of the biggest sources of methane gas which um, is greenhouse gases that destroy the ozone layer and hurt the environment responsible for climate change. So that's his venture, and it's a fabulous venture. There are people who are working on um, things they had worked all their careers on. Um, Some are partnering with big companies. Some are standalone ventures. We have people interested in entrepreneurship and startups, We have somebody who's bringing broadband for internet access to parts of the United States that are a little behind, which is sad to me, by the way, because I know you can stand on the highest mountain in Turkey and get perfect cell reception because of TurkCell. And yet, in the United States, we still have places where you can't. So some people are taking these great business ideas and they're bringing them to places that need it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would like to speak about women in leadership because this is also a necessary topic for you. Uh, I have read an article in a respected business media where the title of the article was 
we can solve climate change and transform business towards sustainability if we involve women in leadership and management positions. What is your opinion on the topic of women leadership? Do you believe that the world would be more sustainable if more women were in leadership and management positions? Well, I'll answer that in an, a slightly unexpected way because I certainly believe in women in leadership, men in leadership, um, people of all colors and races in leadership. I believe in inclusivity and in leadership. And I always advocated for women and also people who are left behind, people of color, because that's fair. And if, because what it says about the workplace, I don't hold women to a higher standard than mm -hmm. men. And I believe there are many male CEOs who are passionate about climate change. There are many women with great values, but there are also women who don't have great values. I believe that there's nothing automatic about being a woman that makes you uh, an inclusive leader, a better leader. And in fact, um, that would be a trap too. Mm -hmm. Just as women were once stereotyped as not as good, I don't want to see women stereotyped as, oh, so much better, and put on a pedestal and have to do everything right. The reason to care about climate change is because of people. And mm -hmm. by the way, women still in most countries in the world have primary responsibility for child care. That's because of social norms. Mm -hmm. That's not because men don't care. Men really care about their kids too, but their organizations have not let them care. Mm -hmm. So I believe that we can make a lot of change, but we don't want to count just on, just on women. I mean, the United States in 2018 elected a record number of women to the U.S. Congress, but mm -hmm. now it, Democrats, but now a record number of Republican women mm -hmm. are running and they don't necessarily believe in climate change. i sorry to say. Um, I do believe in climate change, but I believe that action for the environment is important because the science tells us we have to do something about it. Um, so, yes, let's have more women in leadership, but not because we can automatically assume that women are going to do things that men never did. We want to give men the chance to do that too. Yeah, yeah, I believe it's about cooperation, about put the right people in the right position. Because yes, some people has like a inside feeling that they need to change something in the right direction and have the right values, and some doesn't. So this, this is important, and doesn't matter if this is women or men, and uh, we should cooperate together. Thank you for your opinion. And my last question will be more personal. At Smarthead, we run a project called the yes, I Care, where business leaders express their personal yes, I Care messages about how they support the topic of sustainability in practice. Therefore, my question is, what is your personal yes, I Care message? How do you support sustainability in your personal and professional life? So we always have to be looking forward. So I started out my conversation with you talking about these big problems of the world that I had written about, but I don't spend much time on those problems. Mm -hmm. I immediately say, let's get working. Let's do something about them. And so um, that's my point. We can look back and wish things were different. I don't look back a lot. I sometimes joke that my neck won't turn that far. I can only look forward. And so my message is we have to look to the future and we want the future to unfold in a way that has fewer problems than the past. I'm sure there will be new things that come up. We have to be ready and we have to ensure that our own futures are as bright as, as possible. We're living through a pandemic now. Mm -hmm. It's hurting people. There's a lot of suffering. But what will bring us out of it, I call it the optimism of activism. If you're doing something, if you're active, if you have purpose and meaning, and you're looking forward, you can imagine a world beyond the crisis. And that's what I think we have to do. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, dear Professor Cantor, it was my big pleasure to have this insightful conversation with you about how we can transform businesses to be more sustainable because this is the new way how to build a successful modern business today. I believe that your inspiring thoughts and advice for companies and leaders will contribute to make the world a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. Mm -hmm.